Well, shalom. My name is Todd Bennett, and this is the audio recording of the weekly Shema Israel newsletter. Today's uh, newsletter is entitled Focusing on the Omer During the Count to Shavuot. It was originally published on day 19 of month 2 on the Creator's calendar, also known as May 21st, 2022, on the Roman calendar. It was day 34 of the count, often referred to as the counting of the Omer. Now that count began on the day after the first high Sabbath of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. While they call it the counting of the Omer, we're really counting weeks and days. We count seven sevens and 50 days between Passover and Shavuot. Here's what we read from the Septuagint. And you shall number to yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day on which you shall offer the Omer of the heave offering, seven full weeks, until the morrow after the last week you shall number fifty days, and shall bring a new grain offering to Yahuwah. That's Leviticus 23, 15-16 from the Septuagint translation. They call it the counting of the Omer because it begins with an offering made by the priest of one Omer of barley. Sometimes the emphasis on the Omer is missed as translators often use the word sheaf instead of Omer. Uh, there is no doubt, though, that the word Omer is used in the Hebrew text. It is the first cutting of all the barley harvest. It's the first fruits or the reshit of all the land. And the fact that it is presented by the priest reveals that it is a singular priestly duty performed by the priest on behalf of all the people. The barley stalks were not waved. They were first processed into fine flour and mixed with oil and frankincense before being waved. After that, the people would start to count while they proceeded to harvest their own crops. And the count culminates with a feast known as Shavuot, which is literally weeks. And we read about it in the Torah, Deuteronomy 16, 9 through 10. You shall count seven weeks for yourself. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sickle to the grain. And of course, that was when the first offering was made, the first Rashid offering was made. Then you shall keep the Feast of Weeks to Yahweh your Elohim with the tribute of a free will offering from your hand, which you shall give as Yahweh your Elohim blesses you. So the count culminated with a feast when everyone would appear before Yahweh. Uh, uh, they would come from their at his house, uh, which was built on a threshing floor, by the way, and they would present their first fruits, which were the bikarim of their wheat harvest. And you can read about the, how the house was built on the threshing floor in Second Samuel 24. It's very interesting. And it's, of course, by no coincidence that people are bringing their, their harvest to the threshing floor uh, of Yahuwah. As we've discussed before, there's an intimate connection between this count and the manna. And Omer is actually a dry measure, and it's one-tenth of an ephah, according to Exodus 13. Uh, 1636. This fractional one-tenth portion was the amount of manna that was sufficient for every person. We read about that in Exodus 1616. It says, This is the thing which Yahweh has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. One omer for each person according to the number of persons. Let every man take for those who are in his tent. So, while we're counting the Omer, we cannot help but think about the manna as we proceed to the climax, which is uh, the day after the seventh full week, day 50. It's on day 50 that another offering is made, only this time it's a double portion that includes leaven. And we read about that in Leviticus 23:17. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two-tenths of an ephah. Uh, they shall be of fine flour, they shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits, the bikarim, to Yahuwah. Uh, did you notice the mention of two tenths of an ephah? That is actually two omers. But the omer is not mentioned at Shavuot, and that appears to be intentional. So it seems that, that there is a purposeful connection between the manna and the first barley offering that begins the count. 
Uh, these are the predominant references to the Omer in the scriptures. As a result, there's an ongoing and ancient debate involved, uh, revolving around when the count begins, and that debate is tied to the manna. Does the count begin on the day after the weekly Shabbat on a Sunday, or does it begin on the day after the first Shabbat of unleavened bread? Uh, that's a discussion that many find difficult to grasp, and we've talked about that in, in various uh, newsletters in the past, but it's difficult because the method of counting depends upon translations, definitions, and even traditions. And there's a, a difference of opinion, and they both seem valid depending upon the translation that you rely upon. And I've addressed the technicalities in an article titled, When Do We Celebrate Shavuot, that you can find on the Shema Israel uh, website. It's right on the front page. You just click the icon, and it'll take you to the article. The sects of Israelites uh, contended with this issue in the past, just as people continue to do so today. Uh, and aside from the linguistics of the relevant text, the ancient debate distilled down to what the count actually represented, and that is a subject worth looking into. After all, why not examine the meaning behind this mysterious counting exercise that occurs during the grain harvest? The act of counting is the milk while understanding the meaning is the meat. And the argument that the count always begins on a Sunday is supported by the belief that the manna began to be provided on a Sunday. Uh, the original command was, six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, uh, the Sabbath, there will be none. Uh, based upon this passage, the assumption was that the manna started on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. Uh, they considered the manna to be a transition from the bread of affliction, the unleavened bread, to the bread of freedom. On the other hand, those who believed that the count began on the day after the high Sabbath keyed it to the cessation of the manna after Israel crossed the Jordan and entered the land. They believed that the bread of freedom was not the manna in the wilderness, but rather the bread that they consumed when they finally entered the land, as described in Joshua. It says, Now the children of Israel camped at Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at twilight on the plains of Jericho. And they ate of the produce of the land on the day after the Passover, unleavened bread and parched grain on the very same day. Then the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the produce of the land, and the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. Now it's clear that the manna was not the goal, right? It was supposed to be a temporary provision in the wilderness, but became life support while one generation waited in the wilderness for the previous uh, to die off. It was not the ultimate barakah that Yahuwah had planned for his people. It was a temporary measure, literally. Well, the children of Israel were redeemed and delivered to the Passover. They were not truly free until they entered into the land. The wilderness was not the fulfillment of the promises. So then it seems that the true bread of freedom was not the manna in the wilderness. Rather, it was the bread that they ate from the land that Yahweh planted them in. Immediately upon entering the land, they circumcised the males and celebrated Passover. That means they were not observing the appointed times in the wilderness. Uh, they were not free to celebrate while they were uncircumcised. When the manna stopped, they transitioned back to unleavened bread until the conclusion of the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. Uh, we then read an interesting account of the conquest of Jericho that contains a counting involving seven times seven, followed by a long blast of the shofar. But it was not just any normal shofar blast. Here's the text from a common English translation of the instructions given to Joshua. See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once, this you shall do six days, and seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns, Yogalim shall ferot, before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets or shofars. It shall come to pass, 
when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, Yovel horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, the shofar, that all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. Now, I included Hebrew words that do not translate through into the English, and specifically the fact that the shofar blast is called a Yovel shofar. The fact that, and of course Yovel is Jubilee, uh, the fact that the Jubilee is connected with Joshua is no coincidence. Joshua is a pattern of Messiah Yeshua. That is why they bear the same name. And don't forget, it was Moses who changed his name from Hosea to Yahushua uh, right before he led the recon mission into the land. And you can read that in Numbers 13, 3 through 16. The first time Joshua entered the land, it was as a servant. The second time he entered as a commander of the tribes of Israel. This is highly significant, and we expect this pattern to be fulfilled through Yeshua, the Messiah. Of course, the commandment concerning the Yovel, the Jubilee, is all about being restored to the land of your inheritance. And we read about that in Leviticus 25, beginning at 8, And you shall number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then you shall cause the shofar blast to pass over on the tenth day of the seventh month, in the day of atonement, shall you make the shofar sound throughout all your land. And you shall set apart the fiftieth year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee, a yovel, unto you. And you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. A jubilee, yovel, shall that fiftieth year be unto you. You shall not sow, neither reap, that which grows of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of your wine undressed. For it is the jubilee, it shall be set apart unto you. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. So there's a clear connection with the Omer count and the jubilee count, as we can see from that text. And I hope you can see that the counting of the Omer uh, uh, we're in the midst of has real purpose. We're actually reminded of the Jubilee every year as we rehearse this annual Moed. Uh, we're supposed to be considering the future during this rehearsal that occurs in the midst of the grain harvest. Just as we're counting seven weeks that span from the Rashid barley to the Bikarim wheat, Yahuwah has been counting weeks from the very beginning. Bereshit. Uh, from the first Hebrew word in the scriptures, Bereshit, we can discern the hidden message of a house, which is Beit in Hebrew, uh, for a son, which is Bar, through a covenant, which is Brit, of fire, Esh. And all these words can be found in Bereshit. So you have this message embedded in the Hebrew, the first word of the, the Torah, the first word in Hebrew. You have this powerful, powerful message. It's and it's all contained therein, and it will be fulfilled with a bride through a marriage covenant that can dwell with the son in his house, in his land. So during this time of harvest, we should be longing to be in the land that Yahuwah provides as a bride eating the bread of freedom. Now I always encourage people to read the book of Ruth during this time because it reveals the pattern for Joseph's return to the land, and it occurs uh, between during the grain harvest between the barley and uh, the wheat, uh, once uh, Ruth and Naomi returned to the land, they returned uh, for that harvest. And so the emphasis is the grain harvest. And it's not only a pattern, but take, for instance, the fact that Ruth gleaned an ephah of barley. Of course, we know that would be ten omers. And, of course, ten represents uh, the ten lost tribes. And, of course, Ruth was a foreigner who came into the covenant and, uh, you know, grabbed hold of the covenant as a foreigner, a Moabite. So we'll see, you know, the ten lost tribes who have been scattered in the nations who look like foreigners, we'll see them coming back. Just like Joseph was in Egypt 
and the focus of, of his story was the grain harvest. And his brothers didn't recognize him when he was in Egypt. He was looked like an Egyptian. So too are all of his descendants who are scattered into the world. They look like Babylonians. And, uh, you know, there will be a time when they are revealed and uh, they, they then are brought home. So we're currently waiting for the ten tribes to be revealed and gleaned from the earth during the grain harvest so that they can enter into the marriage covenant renewed by the Messiah. The bread of freedom is not the unleavened bread eaten during a journey, but the bread that has time to rise when we dwell peacefully in the land. And those who recognize Yeshua as the Messiah and are covered by his blood share this hope and long for the Yovel when we can be restored to the land. Uh, that hope should be the focus of our counting. Ultimately, the ancient debate concerning the start of the count was settled by Yeshua and the set-apart spirit long ago. During the time of Yeshua, we know that the majority of Israelites began the count from the day after the first high Sabbath of unleavened bread. Acts 2, 1 described a time when the day of Shavuot had fully come. In other words, the counting of weeks and days had completed. The text continues. They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the set-apart spirit, and began to speak with other languages, as the spirit gave them utterance. And there were during there were dwelling in Jerusalem Yahudim, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And remember that these tongues were understandable languages, and the gift of languages was given so that the good news of Yeshua could be preached to the nations. And I previously discussed you know, the Shavuot connection between the Tower of Babel, Mount Sinai, and Jerusalem in the Jerusalem event in Acts 2, and this is all part of the big picture that Yahuwah has planned to restore his creation. And that's why it's important to be in one accord and in one place. The Spirit sealed the debate for good, and the Spirit confirmed the count through the events described in Acts 2. Those who follow Yeshua and are filled with the Spirit need to move beyond the debate about when to count and turn our focus on why we count. I count weeks and days because I want to leave Egypt, come out of the wilderness, and sound and sound the Yovel Shofar. I want to eat the bread of freedom at the marriage supper with my commander and king, Yeshua. I want to dwell in the land where Yahuwah provides the soil, the seed, the water, and the sun. While the harvest requires work during the count, there is provision beyond the counting. And that's why the appointed times do not end at Shavuot. There are better promises ahead. They await us in the garden where the fruit is located, but only for those in covenant. So, as you continue to count, don't forget that there is much more significance in the Omer. It is often veiled as a tenth part of an Omer. For instance, the sin offering for the poorest for certain trespasses is one-tenth of an ephah, which is an Omer. Uh, the daily grain offering offered by the high priest at the morning and evening uh, sacrifice is one-tenth of an ephah, an omer. The offering of jealousy for a suspected unfaithful wife is one-tenth of an ephah, an omer. And this is just a sampling of the instances where an omer is present, but not so obvious. And as a result, I encourage you to use this time to continue to stay focused on the Omer. I know that it will become uh, much more than a simple task of counting as you discover the Omer in the plan of Elohim. So count with purpose as you follow Yeshua back to the promised land. And thanks to the Spirit, we not only know when to count, but we know why we count. So keep counting to Shavuot, Barakot. Uh, my name is Todd Bennett from ShamaiIsrael.net. Shalom.